Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Claire. I'm a contract librarian on assignment here with the NOAA Central Library. This seminar series is offered through the NOAA Central Library Seminar Program, which provides an educational forum for the presentation of ideas, research updates, and news in support of NOAA's mission. Before we start, I have a few technical tips for attendees. Just so you are aware, you are muted and you are not able to unmute. However, if you have a question, you can type it into the question panel and we will get to those during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. If you are having any audio or visual issues, if you can't hear the speakers or see the slides, try logging out and logging back in to go to webinar. That will solve most issues. And just as a reminder, this is being recorded. If you'd like to revisit this seminar or view previous seminars, you can find them on our YouTube channel. Now I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer, who's going to introduce the speakers today. Thanks, Claire. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for the webinar. I'm Jennifer Zhuang. I'm an economist with the Performance, Risks, and the Social Science Office, um, also called PRSSO. Today's webinar is the fifth part of the Economic Input-Output Modeling Seminar Series that PRSSO is organizing. These seminars are aimed to provide the opportunities for NOAA social scientists, policy analysts, and partners to learn about the concepts, available models, and best practices on this topic uh, for using the ocean and coastal weather related issues. If you are interested in previous seminars, there are recordings uploaded on um, NOAA's library's YouTube channel. And um, stay tuned for another uh, training seminar coming uh, next month on the in-plan model. Um, today's webinar will be focused on the regional input-output models customized by NOAA fisheries scientists um, for use in anal analyzing the baseline economic contributions from commercial and recreational fisheries and the economic impacts resulting from proposed or actual policy changes. In this webinar, the process of creating the models uh, using implant software will be dis uh, um, described with examples from both commercial and recreational fisheries. We have two speakers today. Uh, Sabrina Lavo is a, an uh, economist with the Office of Science and Technology at NIMS. Her work focuses on economic analysis of recreational marine fisheries and the survey designs and implementation. She has been leading NIMS nationwide uh, rec recreational angler expenditure surveys since 2008 and is co-author of a number of reports and publications on the economic contributions of angular expenditors. Scott Stenbeck is an economist with the um, no, uh, Fisheries Northeast Fisheries Science Center. His research primarily focuses on developing economic impact and benefit cost modeling for application to commercial and recreational fisheries management issues. He constructed the first two regional input-output model employed by NIMS, and um, the approach continued to be used to assess regional shoreside impacts of the proposed uh, commercial fishing management policies. With that, I'll hand it over to Scott. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Sabrina and I are happy to have this opportunity to discuss how NOAA Fisheries uses in-plan and input-output analysis to assess the economic contributions and impacts of recreational and commercial fisheries across the country. Sabrina and I will be alternating back and forth a bit during this presentation, but I'm going to kick it off here in the beginning. So I'll start out with just briefly describing what implant is and how we use it at NOAA Fisheries. I'll provide a, a brief description of input output modeling, which is why we use implant, what we use implant for. Uh, I'll explain the difference between economic contributions and economic impacts, two terms that are often 
confused. Sabrina is going to provide an economic contribution assessment of recreational uh, fisheries, and I will provide a hypothetical economic impact assessment of a reduction in uh, commercial fishing revenues for summer flounder. Um, and hopefully we'll have some time for Q&A after that. So Implan, we've been using Implan, I'd say since, it says the late 1990s, I'd say since about the mid 1990s. And it's a commercially available uh, input output software and data package. And in terms of the software, it just provides a user-friendly platform for developing uh, input output models of regional economies. And we use the desktop version. There's also an online version that Implan's trying to push everyone to right now, but the desktop version has more customization uh, tools available to it. So we have stuck with that for the moment anyway. And what we pay for, what you pay for when you buy Implan is really the data, the underlying data um, that you get. And all businesses in the country are aggregated together uh, by industry and type of commodity that they produce. They aggregate businesses together and lump them into one of 544 different business sectors are contained in the model. And they have information on those sectors. They have output, sales information, employment, uh, value added, you can think of as uh, GDP or gross regional product, income, final demand, household purchases of goods and services, exports by these businesses. They have all of this data at a county level for every county in the US. And analysis can be done at the county level or state, national level, or even a multi-regional level, you know, in group counties and states together. And we purchase updated data sets, I'd say every two, maybe three years. Uh, it's expensive. The economy doesn't change that much usually from year to year. So we buy it about every three years or so. So why do we use IO models? Well, they allow us to estimate the total economic contributions of commercial and recreational fishing at a regional or national level. Uh, Sabrina is going to show you how we do that for recreational fishing. And it also provides us with ability to estimate regional economic impacts of fishery management actions. An example I will show you. And there are legal mandates that require us to recognize and assess the impacts of management actions on communities and fishery dependent and independent businesses. And so IO models help us meet those legislative mandates. So most of you on this call, I'm sure are aware of what IO models are. So I'll have one slide here on this, but IO models track the linkages between businesses and final consumers. And they capture both market and now non-market financial flows. So these are you know, transfers of government funds to people and businesses, you know, social security, unemployment compensation, also like interest and in dividend payments from businesses to households. All of this is now captured in these models. And using this, we can estimate you know, what's the direct, indirect induced effects of money that cycles through an economy or their multiplier effects um, of this. And the example I'm showing you here is for say a commercial fishing business. So the direct sales would just be the ex vessel revenues of that commercial fishing business. And the income would be the crew wages and salaries uh, maybe to captains um, that are earned, including the owner income. Uh, employment would just be the numbers of crew and captain that are employed in the industry. So that's the direct sales income and employment. But there are also indirect effects of commercial fishing activity. You know, they buy supplies, they buy gear and fuel and sometimes bait and pay insurance in order to go fishing. So there are supporting businesses that are 
affected uh, as well. These are the indirect effects. Those businesses also purchase supplies, you know, goods and services, and so on and so forth until those effects leave the region that you're concerned about. Uh, they capture all of those multiplier effects through the region. The induced effects are, in our example here, would be the income earned by the crew and the captains and the owners and, and how they, they spend that money. And some of that remains in the local economy. They go to you know, grocery stores and banks, et cetera, buy gas. And so it filters through the economy that way as well. So IO models capture the induced effects as well. There are, of course, limitations and assumptions of I.O. models, as with all models. I.O. analysis is not a substitute for benefit-cost analysis. I.O. simply describes the effects of expenditures. So that money that the commercial fishing business is spending to operate, it describes the effects of that. Where benefit cost analysis is usually concerned with estimating changes in net economic value or you know, producer and consumer surpluses. Uh, it's generally thought of as the difference between benefits and expenditures, whereas IO simply describe the effects of those expenditures. So they're two different concepts entirely. And I.O. models are generally static as well. They're not dynamic, and they simply provide a snapshot of economic effects at a single point in time rather than kind of a discounted sum of future effects. You, you can modify the model so that it could do some of that, but in general, it, it's a static model. There are assumptions as well. Uh, constant returns to scale. It's just that the cost functions that are contained within the models are linear. Uh, and so if additional outputs require all inputs increase proportionately. Uh, no supply constraints. It assumes that supplies in a region uh, for, a, for an industry are unlimited. Outputs limited only by the demand for its products. And then you have this fixed commodity input structure, which is just firms can't buy substitute goods. Uh, Supplies are perfectly elastic. So there are some assumptions and limitations you have to live with to use IO here. Contributions, economic contributions versus economic impacts. So economic contributions, they show how, when you do an economic contribution assessment, it shows how economic activity associated with an industry cycles through a region's existing economy. Uh, that's the key word, the existing economy. So we often get requests for what is you know, the contribution of commercial or recreational fishing to the country or to a particular state. So what they mean by that is not only the revenue, employment, and income generated in commercial fishing, but also tracking that all of the activity, all of the supporting activity, all the businesses that support commercial fishing. What are the, the revenue, the income, employment associated with those businesses as well? So that's what an economic contribution analysis is. Whereas economic impact, they an economic impact analysis predicts shifts in regional economic activity from a change in a regional industry. So think about maybe a, a hurricane comes through and wipes out all the commercial fishing boats in a particular county. So in the short term now, there's a lot, there's a loss in, in economic activity associated with those commercial fishing boats now not being able to go out fishing. So in addition to the losses to the crew and the owners and the captain, there are supporting businesses in that county and outside that county that supply goods and services to those commercial fishermen, and they will also be affected now by this change. So economic impact analysis estimates, you know, what that activity, what the level of that, that activity would be associated with that change. So now Sabrina is going to provide a assessment of how we use in plan associated with uh, recreational um, fishing data that we have.
So go ahead, Sabrina. Thank you, Scott. Um, yes, yeah, so um, at uh, NOAA Fisheries, we're interested in uh, both recreational and commercial fishing. Um, and one of the ways we learn about what um, impacts or contributions that uh, stem from recreational fishing is to do surveys of the recreational anglers um, who are spending money across the country um, when they go fishing or when they got, buy uh, things like fishing poles or boats that they use for fishing. So um, what we do is every three to five years, we do a survey across the nation in all the coastal states. Oops, can you go back, Scott? Can you go back one slide? Yeah, thanks. Um, and we interview anglers or we contact them using uh, fishing licenses um, and we contact them by mail or email and ask them to fill out a survey asking what they spent on their most recent fishing trips. And then we have another part of that survey that we do in alternate years um, that asks them about their, what we call durable goods um, and ask them things like, did you buy a boat that you use for fishing? What about fishing uh, rods and reels, tackle, clothing related to fishing, things like that. Um, so the reason we're doing this and how we use it is we come up with average expenditures on various categories, which I'll show you in a moment, both on the trip side and the durable goods side. And just as a sort of baseline, we say here are the contributions that these expenditures make to the states, you know, before any changes. Now, as Scott said, sometimes there's things like hurricanes or oil spills. And if we want to look at the impacts to that, um, we can do that using the data that we've already collected and make some, you know, changes. So next slide, please. So what the first thing after I've gotten all the data from the surveys and we're just talking about, I'll just give the example about the trip expenditures here. Um, I get average expenditures by a fishing day for each angler. And we look at things like airfare, auto fuel, auto rental, bait, boat fuel, boat rental, um, trips on charter, uh, like what they paid to go on a charter trip, either their fee or their tips to the um, crew. If they had any fish processing, what did they buy in groceries? Or did they stop at a restaurant? Did they buy any souvenirs on their fishing trip? Did they have ice? Did they have to stay in a hotel? Did they go park, you know, park somewhere? Um, did they use public transportation? And did they participate in a tournament with tournament fees? So those are the categories that we look at. And so after I have all the average expenditures, I multiply them by the number of total angler trips in that state, let's say, to get total expenditures. Now I have to allocate those to the in-plan uh, types or the categories as Scott was talking about. Um, I'm giving you the example of the 2017 in-plan data, which at the time had 536 sectors. So all of these sectors um, in in-plan are matched to NAICS codes, industry codes. So you can look up and either an implant or in the next codes, uh, this crosswalk between the thing you're looking at, let's say auto fuel, petroleum refineries, and what code that is an implant. And so that's what I've done here. So before we do any analysis, we have to match the type of expenditure and the commodity we're talking about to these implant sectors. And so that's what it's showing you here. So implant sectors are numbered and these are the different numbers associated with these expenditures. Um, we talk about industry versus commodity. Um, industry is at like sort of the primary level of the industry. So in this case, let's say the for hire or the, the charter fishing, um, that's the, the anglers buying it directly from the industry, in this case, the charter boat. Um, in other cases, they're buying it after it's uh, like maybe been sold by a retail shop, uh, let's say the you know gas station in the case of fuel. And so what we have to do is make that adjustment and we call those the margins. For things like food um, purchased from grocery stores, we don't know exactly what the angler is buying. So we allocate it based on um, implants, household uh, purchases of consumption of uh, food for you know, use at home. That's called the household PCE vector. And, and it just basically has all the different kind of things you could buy like at a grocery store in proportion to how people normally buy it. So we just go with that sort of you know, spread of different categories. And um, also for things that are paid to the state or local government, say like parking at a state park, there's another um, database in Implan called state and local government. Um, and so we use that for the parking, but everything else is by industry. Okay, next slide. Okay, so how do we actually do it? So now I have all the expenditures matched to the categories. 
by you know dollar value, and I have that in an Excel spreadsheet. Now I go into Implan and I create a state model, and I'm going to give you the example here of Massachusetts. So I've created the model, and I've used the trade flows method and the SAM multipliers, which you can see over here on the left. It tells you about the model, like where is it, what's the model year, and some background of the base case, let's say, in Massachusetts before we've done anything. And so that's what this is showing you. Okay, so we always have to be careful that we match the expenditure year to the model year. So in this case, my expenditures were collected in 2017. So that's the model year that I'm doing. So that's at the top. Okay, next, please. All right, so step two is I take all those Excel templates that I've uh, matched the categories to the, the values and I import them. And at the top, you can see the different things you can do. So I go to activity options and here I've already done it, but if you were actually doing this, you'd say activity options, import the Excel template. And I do that for each of the different modes I've collected expenditures in. And in recreational fishing, we, we talk about for hire, which is like charter and head boats. We talk about private boats and we talk about people who fish from shore. So for those three modes, I've uploaded all the different expenditures by either the industry grouping or these household PCE vectors or the state things, which are those institutional spending things you see there. So let's look at the for hire. And so this, once you've created all these activities at the top panel, then within each activity are the events and the events correspond to the amount everyone spent by those categories I showed you earlier. So that's what this lower thing is. And then once you're in this screen, you have to just do a few adjustments. Like I said, you wanna make sure that you adjust the things that are at the retail level have these local purchase percentages. And so if you look down at that blue arrow, it's saying, for instance, manufactured ice is probably bought at like a convenience store. So we want to look at the, the margin on that one. And so that's that 38%. So that's what we're doing here. We make some small adjustments and then we're ready to go to the next screen. Next, yeah. And here's where we set up our, our scenarios, what Implan calls scenarios. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to group all the four higher expenses together. Later, I'll do all the private boat and then all the shore boat because I want to get the results by each of those fishing modes. So I've grouped them all by selecting the four higher categories, the groceries, the parking, the crew, and the industry things, which I'm just calling four higher here. And if you wanted to, you could do a multi-regional analysis that shows the flow of expenditures and things between, let's say, Florida and Georgia. But here I'm just doing one state, it's Massachusetts, and that's how we typically do it. Okay, so then I go to the next step, I run the scenario. And what happens is you get this um, output, um, which shows you the results. And you can choose the results to be in a different year if you wanted, but I always choose the same year. Um, so that's 217. And up at the top, it will show you the direct effects, and then it will show you the indirect and induced. For the purposes of our analysis, I always sum all those up and get that total effect, which I've showed you here with the blue arrow. And just so you can see it, what's happening here in for higher fishing in Massachusetts generates 400, oh, there shouldn't be a dollar sign, but 463 jobs, both full and part-time, 19.3 million in labor income, 31.8 in value added, and 49.7 million in output and sales. Again, from the direct, indirect, and induced. And another thing that's nice about Implan is you can see it tells you the top 10 industries affected for each of the different scenarios. And so that's what you can see down below. I don't typically publish that, um, but if you wanted to do analysis that looked at that, you could, and that's down there. And it also gives you tax impacts. There's a little thing up at the top you could click on. It says tax impacts, et cetera. So there's a lot of information here. Um, and that's basically, in a nutshell, what we're doing. And I'm not going to turn it over to Scott so he can talk about the commercial fishing example. Uh Okay, and we'll come back and wrap up the rec and the commercial at the end as well. I'll show you a few more statistics about that. But uh, we'll move on to a model that I have uh, built for the Northeast region. And this model was to serve several purposes. And one is was to conduct economic contribution assessments, similar to what Sabrina has talked about, but on the commercial side. But we, I also needed it to be able to 
estimate what economic impacts are of changes in fishery management actions. And we often don't have a lot of time to conduct these types of assessments. We do this for proposed regulations. And so we're always, we don't have much time at all. So we needed to have a model like this set up where we, we could generate these types of estimates uh, rather quickly. And also wanted it to be able to link up to some ecosystem models that others in my branch are working on to calculate changes in economic indicators, jobs and income. And we have done that, but I will not be speaking about that here um, today. It's a little more involved. So this is on the commercial side, IO modeling is a little more complicated. And this is showing you a flow chart of what we're dealing with on the commercial side. And so you have commercial harvesters and they are buying you know, inputs so that they can go fishing, fuel, ice, food, gear, nets, uh, insurance, and they're paying labor. So they're paying crew and captains as well. And then they catch their, their fish and they sell it to, in this flow chart, to wholesalers. So for federally permitted, um, for species that we manage, if, um, federally permitted species, uh, uh, harvesters need to have a permit to land these federal species. And they have to report, they file log books, or vessel trip reports, uh, and show what species they caught the pounds, the value of those species, and uh, where they were landed. And they have to sell to federally permitted dealers. And dealers also have to submit reports as to who they bought it from, what they bought, price they paid, et cetera. So we have some checks and balances there for understanding what's going on. So we have pretty good data at the harvesting level and the wholesale level. From there, things get a little tricky. Uh, so wholesalers, then they they can do a number of things with their seafood. They can export it out of the region or out of the country. They can sell directly to you and I, final consumers. Uh, they can also sell directly to grocery stores and restaurants. And most of their seafood, however, goes to seafood processors, most of what they sell. And seafood processors, in turn, uh, they also export out of the region, out of the country, and sell to final consumers, directly to final consumers, and sell to grocery stores, restaurants. And grocery, store, and, grocery stores and restaurants, and they, in turn, sell to final consumers. So, you know, we don't have a lot of information detailed information on those product flows, and it varies by species and by region. Uh, so we do estimate at a national level, we do have an IO model that estimates what these sort of downstream effects would be. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about that here today. All I'm going to talk about is the impacts associated with commercial harvesting. So these downstream impacts, uh, it's, we have a report that comes out once a year, which we'll talk about at the end that captures these, but today I'm not going to talk about those. So implant on the commercial fishing side, there's four commercial fishing related sectors in the default implant model, but they're generally we can't use those sectors to describe the economic activity associated with commercial fishing management actions. Um, in plan sector 14, this is 2019 data now that I'm talking about, the most recent data that we have available from in plan. Uh, this in plan sector 14, this is where seafood aquaculture is included, but this also includes you know, farming, uh, a lot of meat farming and dairy farming. And so it, it's, Seafood aquaculture is only a portion of what's included here. And in plan sector 17 is a commercial fishing sector, but it's an aggregate sector across all commercial fishing sectors, um, all species, all gears. And we often manage 
implement regulations at a species level. So this sector doesn't really help us identify impacts at, at that of a disaggregated level. There is a sector 92 is a seafood processing sector. Again, it's an aggregate sector for all seafood processing and sector 398 is a wholesale trade sector that includes seafood, but it's a grocery related products wholesaler sector. So it includes all wholesale of every product you buy at a grocery store, which so seafood makes up a small part of that as well. So we generally can't use these um, at a more disaggregate level. So for us, when we regulate commercial fishermen, we all of our regulations that we implement target commercial harvesters. We don't regulate wholesalers or processors or you know the retail level. Our regulations target commercial harvesters and often specific species since that is how we manage at this time, sort of species by species, and they target certain gear sectors sometimes as well. So I grouped harvesting activities that occur here in the Northeast into 19 distinct species, species groups and 13 gear sectors. So these are the species or species groups. So these are the species that we manage at a federal level in the Northeast. So I wanted the model to cover all of these species or species groups here. And these are the 13 gear sectors. And these are the primary gears that we have here in the Northeast that, that catch um, fin fish and shellfish. And I also split it up by size for some of these gears into large and small because the cost structures can be quite different between you know, large operations and small operations. So to do this, we need quite a bit of data, uh, commercial harvesting data. So where do we get all of this information? So the species level revenue by gear, I already mentioned, it, that's available through the vessel and dealer trip reports. So we have very good revenue data uh, at a trip level uh, by species and by gear um, from the vessel trip reports and the dealer trip reports. We also collect cost data. Uh, our NOAA fisheries observers collect uh, some trip level cost data. I mean, the primary purpose of the observers is biological, but while they are out there on the vessels, they also collect uh, trip level cost data. So how much was spent on fuel, oil, ice, some supplies, uh, food and bait for that particular trip that they're out on. And then we do, periodically we conduct additional surveys to collect, I'm calling here fixed cost data or more of the annual costs, such as like insurance or you know, maintenance and repairs that took place over the year. We do a survey periodically to collect this type of information. So. Combined with the observer trip cost data, we have information uh, by gear as to cost level data by gear in, in, in addition to you know, payments to crew and estimates of what those gears earn on average. So what I'm going to show you is uh, provide a hypothetical sort of we'll do a hypothetical economic impact assessment here of a reduction let's say a stock assessment came out and it shows it's showing that summer flounder stock isn't doing as well as it was so next year there's going to be a reduction in the annual catch limit for summer flounder in the northeast and we estimate that reduction is going to reduce commercial fishing harvesting revenue by five million dollars so we're going to do an economic impact assessment. What does this $5 million reduction in ex vessel revenues mean for the Northeast region? So I assign that 
summer flounder five million reduction to the commercial harvesting gear groups from our uh, based on the, uh, the trip reports we know which gears are catching summer flounder and in what proportion so we use the most recent data say from 2020 is what i used so we just assume this same structure will exist next year in terms of the gears landing summer flounder and we can assign this five million dollar change to these gear sectors as you can see large otter trawls land most of the summer flounder in the northeast region about 97 percent of that so in this example here we're going to be assuming that X vessel revenues are going to decline by over 4.8 million next year for large otter trawls. And then you can see the reductions in the other gears here that we're, we'll be um, assuming here for next year. Then I sign the commercial harvesting expenses to implant sectors. So this is where our cost data come in. And we, we know we create these linear production functions from this cost data that we have. So if you look at the large otter trawls in the last column, we know for every dollar of revenue earned by large otter trawlers, uh, we know where that money gets spent. What proportion goes to the first row there, repair and maintenance? What proportion of that dollar goes to mooring uh, expenses, et cetera? And so now we can attribute this, this loss that we'll be assuming will occur to otter trawls next year of a little over 4.8 million, we can break that out into these expense categories. And then we assign these expense categories, just like Sabrina did on the recreation side, we have to look at implant and determine based on the NAICS codes for that type of expense, which implant sector it applies to. And in some cases it might apply to more than one. So we have to come up with a way to allocate it to those sectors. And in some cases we have, we have specific data to do that. In other cases, we have to make a best estimate. And repair and maintenance, for example, could sometimes repairs or maintenance are done by the crew on the boat, other times uh, a marina. They have to bring it into a marina for those repairs and maintenance. And so we don't have an exact estimate of that. So in this case, we assign 50% to the marina and 50% goes to, uh, it's like repair shops that where the crew members would be buying parts um, to make those repairs themselves. So there is some of that involved in this, uh, in, in allocating to these implant sectors. This is, this part takes a little bit of time. And then after we do that, I turn to implant and the first step, similar to what Sabrina showed, we create the base Northeast region implant model. And so for the Northeast region encompasses 10 coastal states from Maine through Virginia. So you can see that down here in the lower left. I just add in all of these states and I can construct the baseline model that we will be using to estimate how this $5 million change in uh, reduction in summer flounder revenue filters through the economy. So the second step would be to set up the activities just like Sabrina did. And what you see here what I'm pointing out here is the commercial harvesting expenses. So the goods and services that they're purchasing uh, to go fishing. So I aggregate those across all the gear sectors that caught summer flounder. And then I import that into implant. And that's what you see here in the bottom screen here. So there, you know, a certain portion of that five million goes to pay insurance carriers, which is the first row on the bottom there. Let me see petroleum refineries in there, manufactured ice, et cetera. So this is the production function uh, for across all of the gears that catch summer flounder. And I've just imported that in here now. 
there are other activities that you have to uh, include as well. Here is payments to crew. So this is, it would enter that in down here at the bottom. That $5 million reduction uh, I've estimated is associated with about 1.3 million in payments to crew and captains. You know, crew share is a huge part of the production function of a fishing vessel. And so that gets entered in down here and we're going to run that through as well because you know, that's money now that won't be available to be spent in the Northeast region uh, through the uh, income that the crew and the captains and the owners um, spent would spend. They won't be spending that now. That's the assumption here. There's also, uh, this is the owner income actually. So that was just crew and captains. Uh, that I showed you on the previous screen. I, I'm running the owner income through separately here. Uh, owner, it's, they earn a little bit more than the crew and the captains, and we can estimate that from the data that we have. The average owner makes between 70 and $100,000. Uh, so we can run the expenditure pattern. There's like nine different expenditure patterns included in implant, I believe. and because each one, each different expenditure pattern spends money in slightly different ways. You know, the more money you make, the more you save, et cetera. So this, that, those savings rate, those spending patterns, they would be for the owner would be associated with this 70 to 100K here. Um, so we would include all of this in here, all of these activities. And that's what you see here on the right. We're getting ready to run all of these activities at the same time to see what the total impact of the reduction would be. So we run that and we end up with these results that you see here. There's a lot of results. It was just easier to summarize here in this final sheet uh, in these two tables. So the, what you see there in the top are the total estimated economic impacts of that $5 million reduction in summer flounder revenue. So, it, oops, sorry, that this row that says direct, that's the commercial fishing sector. So there's a decline of $5 million in sales. This is the income associated with the 5 million. So this is just the captain and the crew income and the owner income. Value added is similar to uh, the gross regional product and employment. There's 40 jobs associated with that $5 million reduction. It doesn't mean there's going to be a loss of 40 jobs necessarily. It's just those are the jobs that are based on the multiplier is associated with commercial fishing. And remember this model is static. It's not dynamic. So this is sort of a short term immediate look at what the impacts are. If the fishing business is able to offset some of this decline in revenue by increasing their landings of other species, then they could reduce these impacts. We're not capturing that here, or maybe the owner decides, well, I'm going to, to pay those employees the same amount of money. I'm just going to take a hit on this. Not likely, but it's possible. So, but these, this model, the IO models don't capture those kinds of changes. So there won't necessarily be a loss of 40 crew and captain jobs here. If you look down the columns, you see the indirect and induced effects on sales income value added and employment. So these are the, the multiplier effects to the supporting businesses. So if you look at sales, the, while there was a $5 million reduction to commercial harvesting revenues, the total reduction in sales or revenues across all businesses in the Northeast region, there's another 5.5. 3 million for a total of you know 10.3 million. So that's how the multiplier works out to be about 2.05 there. So for each dollar change in summer flounder revenue, there's an additional dollar and five cents associated with that through the supporting uh, businesses that support the uh, summer flounder commercial harvesting industry. If you look down the bottom, this is the same 
table at the bottom. It's what screen show the top 10 for employment is what I'm showing here. Uh, you see summer flounder would be number one in terms of the impacts. Uh, there's 40 jobs that I talked about. Underneath the next closest would be other amusement and recreation industries at 3.6. This is where marinas are included and commercial fishing vessels buy a lot of services and products from marinas. So there's another 3.6 jobs that could be affected by this $5 million reduction there as well. Sabrina, you want to pick back up right here? Yes, thank you. Um, so we just wanted to give you a brief um, introduction to um, a series of reports that uh, the Office of Science and Technology publishes on behalf of all of the rest of um, the economists and social scientists across NOAA Fisheries, and that's called the Fisheries Economics of the United States. We do it every year. I'm just giving you a screenshot here of the 2015 one. Um, and what we do in this is we do by state and as well at the national level, um, both the commercial and the recreational um, uh, fishing economic contributions. We also provide um, some limited information on um, harvests of key species in each state, both commercial and rec, and then the angler expenditure data uh, for every state and um, at the national level, and then also commercial revenues, both with and without imports and seafood processors, et cetera. And down there you have a link if you want to go and explore the data. We have it as a PDF, but we also have it now as a um, interactive tool that you can basically search by state or whatever category you're looking for, and it will print out uh, graphs and um, charts as well as tables of the same information that's in the actual PDF. Um, next slide, please. So here's from 2017. Um, what was uh, both commercial and recreational impacts. So you could see together they had 1.74 million jobs um, and contributed to 244.1 billion in sales or output and 110.7 billion in value added. We didn't show the labor income in this infographic. And you can see how it's broken out between commercial and rec. So commercial is the lion's share, obviously, of these uh, impacts or contributions. Um, rec is a lot smaller, but not you know, trivial. So again, for more information, you can go to the FEUS website and explore the data there. And, and we have the old um, previous year's uh, PDFs as well. So you can look back for various years and, and 2018 should be coming out shortly. So, okay, I guess we have time for questions. Thanks, hey, Scott and Sabrina. Um, we do have questions coming in for our attendees. Uh, just a reminder, you can put questions in the question panel on GoToWebinar. Um, so our first question, when you do state-by-state -state impacts, do you underestimate regional impacts due to interstate transfers? Scott, yeah, do you can, want to take that? Sure. Yeah, so that is uh, correct. Um, well, that's why we show the state level impacts and you would have to run separate models if you wanted to aggregate those states together to capture those activities the sales and purchases the state by state sales and purchases there so yeah if you summed up the state numbers that we publish that will underrepresent the total impacts because uh, it fails to account for those uh, exchanges between states if you were to do that. So yes, that's accurate. However, we do do it at the national level and at the national level, it, it's accounting for all of those interstate things. Thanks. Um, I don't have any more questions here yet, but I am going to wait just a few seconds to see if anybody submits anything. All right, our unlicensed or unregistered recreational anglers who fish only on headboats that do not require a license considered in the sample for the angler expenditure survey? Um, for the most part, yes, because what we do is um, we ask the expenditure survey, at least in the states on the Atlantic and Gulf Coast, as part of the um, Marine Recreational Information or MRIP programs intercept survey, and they have interviewers that 
um, go on the head boats. So when they ask those anglers on the head boats, it doesn't matter if they have a license or not, we're capturing them as well. All right, can we use similar, can we use a similar model to get to finer geographic scales at the county and local level? Well, the answer would be yes, because there are implant provide if you buy the county data, um, there's counties in all the states. So you could aggregate the counties however you want it, or you could just do a single county, yes. All right, and I'm just waiting another minute here to see if any other questions come through. Okay, and it looks like that's it for the questions today. So I just want to thank our speakers, Scott and Sabrina. Thank you all for joining us. You will be able to find this presentation on YouTube. Um, usually we'll have that up by the next day. When the presentation ends, you will see a survey. If you could take the time to fill this out, we do use these surveys to improve marketing our library seminar service and inform future seminar topics. Thank you all again for joining us and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.